Happy Halloween, everybody. On this week's episode of Work Trends, we're talking about overcoming your fears to take big leaps in your career, even into scary new industries. Welcome to the Work Trends podcast from Talent Culture. I'm your host, Megan M. Bureau. Every week, I interview interesting people and brands who are reimagining work. For more information, be sure to check us out at talentculture.com and join us live on Twitter every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern using the hashtag WorkTrends. I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Kevin W. Grossman. Happy Halloween, Megan and Biro. Boo! (laughs) Ha ha! What are you guys dressing up as this year? Because I know I'm going to wander on over to your Instagram or Facebook (laughs) account, and there's going to be some big surprise there. You're going to see it all. You know me. I'll be sharing it as soon as as soon as we got them all. We're all dressed up. So my youngest is going to be an angel this year. That's she's been all about that. And my oldest, uh, who will be definitely be a horror fan someday. Beatrice is Beatrice loves the horror. So she's going to be a zombie. That's what she's already decided. And we've already got the costume ready to go. And then my wife and I are going to be candy and we're going to have a little tongue in cheek fun. I'm going to be big hunk and she's going to be hot tamale. Oh my gosh. I am in (laughs) love and want to be there with you guys to celebrate this. Seriously. How fun are you? And I have to say, I'm not sure yet what Ron and I are dressing up as, but we know we're going to have fun either way um, because that's how we roll. And dot, dot, dot. We're kind of waiting until last minute because we want to see like a little bit more of the ideas float and then really surprise everybody. Since today we're talking about all things spooky, we're going to talk a little bit, a lot about something a little bit more controversial, an industry that can scare some people, even a lot of people, maybe some of our listeners as well. And that's the cannabis industry. And that's marijuana people. Okay. Mary Jane. Yes. It is now a legalized industry and thriving in more states like California and now in Canada. And it continues to to expand throughout. It's not legal in all 50 states in North America, but it is uh, growing on a regular basis. Now, it doesn't scare everybody because I was just reading some of the latest stats on the industry. Now, Megan, did you know that the global legal marijuana industry will reach more than 20 billion by 2025? Mm, I did know that because there's a lot of people that are walking around like the walking dead, no pun intended. Like, what do we do with this big thing? What do we do with Mary Jane? Uh, uh, How are we not going to get in trouble here, especially as we start talking about marijuana and cannabis? And I don't care how you roll on that. You can call it anything you want to call it. It's coming into the workplace. Absolutely. And startups in the industry, they're just really, they're exploding. And so financing to cannabis companies, more than doubled in 2017. That's disrupting industries like pharmaceuticals and beauty products, but also some less expected industries like packaging and textiles. Now that means more jobs in the industry too. Of course, that's what a, the, a lot of our focus is here around the world of work at Work Trends. So, and jobs are something that our, I know our listeners care a lot about. There was a 690% increase in overall marijuana industry job listings between January 1st, 2017 and August 1st, 2018. Wow. That's got my attention and I'm super excited about it. And that makes me want to hear more from our first guest who has one of these jobs. Our first guest is Stormy Simon. You may know her as the former president of the online shopping site Overstock. Actually, one of my one of my faves. I was an early adopter of that. She is here today to talk about how she's overcome some scary obstacles to find her big career success and to share her latest mission, taking that spooky stigma out of the cannabis industry. So welcome to Work Trends Stormy. Thank you, Megan. And happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. I have to admit when um, your name came across my transom on email, I said Stormy Simon. The name alone. You know what I mean? (laughs) It can be a little scary nowadays. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So you have a fascinating background. You started at Overstock as a temp who sat outside the CEO's office. And 15 years later, you were president of the company. What did you learn about taking chances and creating your own 
career? Well, Overstock.com was quite a ride. I learned more than I possibly could have thought when I walked into interview. And the best part about arriving at Overstock in such the beginning of an emerging industry was the ability to take a chance. You know, there we were sitting in offices, creating a new way to shop, changing the habits of consumers. And in 2001, when I, when I started there, you know, I myself had never placed an online order. People in the office hadn't really ever done it. And so we're, we were creating habits that no one had done. And that gave the ability to take a chance because you were first, which also turned out to be a lot of fun, you know. But as far as my success there, you know, I didn't go to college. I have an untraditional path to the corner office. And I being in an industry where things really weren't figured out yet, and we had to define it as we went every day and figure out new metrics every day, um, really created an environment where I felt free to have ideas or say them out loud because I was on an equal playing field. You know, no one really knew what the heck e-commerce was going to be, how big yeah. it would be, what the wins were going to be. And, you know, throughout that, I was fortunate enough to get some really good home runs. Okay. So you were president of a company you helped catapult into this huge success we're talking about. Your work has been respected. You felt good. Life was good. Then you decided to take another big leap. Tell us, how did you actually decide to leave Overstock and strike out into something new? That was a big deal. Um, and it took a long time. It was one of those multi-year struggling back and forth decisions. You know, wasn't it something I took lightly and all of us get frustrated at work. So I knew it was beyond that. You know, 15 years is a long time. And when you start as a temp and really an entry level position and you go through the, and we were $18 million the year I started and the year I left, we were about 1.9 billion. So wow. the epic growth and rise and build the number of employees and space and all of that is a super exciting time. And 15 years later, I had done just so much within that company and built a lot too that I started thinking, you know, then I became an empty nester. I became, I I, I don't really say the G word, but my son had a daughter and (laughs) those things, come on, you know, I started I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's Lala. <laughs> I get called Lala. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, it's a good it's a good save. I think people know what it means anyway. <laughs> um, but I really it wasn't that I found myself unhappy. I wasn't as happy. I started becoming interested in things that were going on outside of the office and the legalization of cannabis was one of those things. Mm-hmm. You know, when Colorado decided to go recreational and just change the way that this plant was viewed by the world. My mind went to the prohibition history books and the way things evolved and how the country had to figure out a way. And, you know, at that point, it's alcohol, right? So we're talking about something very different. But Mm -hmm. the country had to figure it out. Books were written. People participated in history. And that's what I felt was going to happen with this plant. Now, when I first started thinking about leaving Overstock, I had no idea. I just thought, what would I go do? Where would I go? Would I live here? And what I decided over the course of time was if I was going to go to another e-commerce company right now and do the same thing, why would I leave? Yeah. No, it doesn't make sense. You've had that. You've been there, done that. And then when you start a new job, we all know it's hard. You have to go in, prove yourself, find your groove, find your find your tribe. You know, Mm -hmm. you got to figure your stuff out and a much, you know, more difficult path to do relatively the same thing. And that's when I decided looking outside of other industries and then landing, landing with cannabis. Very cool. I'm somebody who's yeah. been closely watching that whole industry. And I was, you know, excited for Colorado when that happened. I think there's a lot of opportunity um, when you talk about just entrepreneurial opportunities in business. I think also culturally, the way we're looking at pain relief, the legality Absolutely. of it all. I mean, it's just a cultural movement. So I can understand why you're excited because there is a lot of activity. There's also a lot of legal loopholes. You know, I have friends in Vegas who are in the industry and it's been one giant headache when it comes to yeah. getting through all of that hubbub when you start talking it legality. Is, it's it's beyond anything I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, and when I jumped in, you know, I came from a big business and my work history had kind of big pe- been pieces of bigger businesses. And so to come into cannabis and expect, you know, solidified businesses, you know, with the foundation and then coming in and realizing I worked at a 90,000 square foot grow with two medicinal dispensaries, realizing these businesses were so new. But mm-hmm. not only that, the rules kept changing. 
right? So the rules and the, the guidelines would change. Now we need to add this to a package. Well, that's a cost in your production. That's an added cost of the sticker. You know, there's all these things that you have to adjust on these young businesses that are heavily taxed. And that was surprising to see. They aren't treated within their state as an equal business to any other business. So if you have a grocer that only sells lettuce, they are going to pay less taxes than someone that only sells cannabis. You know, where you put your money, there's no banking options. There's, you know, you're paying outrageously for banking op- options. And now banks are starting to, you know, come up with solutions. But two years ago, it was archaic. You know, you're clearly not somebody who's afraid of change or afraid of yes. all that gray that's happening, basically. Let's talk about your current mission a little bit, which is taking the stigma out of the cannabis industry. What are the most common misconceptions you hear about? the industry? And why are people so afraid of cannabis? Well, the most, it's hard to say what the most common is because it's really just a fear. And so I think for me, you know, what I found as I jumped into this industry was this just unbelievable history about the plant, not the history about banning the plant and all of those things, but the plant itself. And it starts a super long time ago with a Chinese emperor, like 2737 BC. And this emperor, the first on record that's been found, starts prescribing cannabis tea for ailments. People get sick. Mm -hmm. And as time goes on, you know, thousands of years are passing, right? But the Indians start using it for leprosy. In Greece, they start begin using it for for medical remedies. The Egyptians start prescribing it. So these are different continents, different people that are all stumbling upon this plant and finding different ways to leverage it. And then as the years go by uh, in China, surgeons start using the resin as an anesthetic. And then, you know, they start documenting it in their medical journals and enter the U.S. It comes over to the North America in the 1600s. George Washington, our first president, there he completely is, completely involved in hemp with THC. Right. Who knew? And the Queen of England uses it. Well, we bury this part of history, I think, a yeah. little bit. Not bury it, but we don't talk about it as much no. as we could. And by 1850, the U.S is using it for neurological reasons, typhus, rabies, alcoholism, opiate addiction, all of that in 1850. And it gets added to the U.S. pharmacopoeia. In the 1900s, what is that? 1900, 118 mm-hmm. years ago, this thing's added in our, pharm- our pharmacy book. It was accepted. We're growing it. Early 1900s, we're growing it like crazy. Pharmaceutical farm, 60,000 pounds annually. States start governing it anyway, The and the prohibition starts, right? Right around the early 1900s, the Mexican immigrants also come, and they introduce it more as a recreational use, right? They've just been using it recreationally. I think at that point in history dictates about the 1930s that our leadership, Harry Anslinger, who was the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, and William Hearst, who mm-hmm. has publishing companies, they start writing about cannabis and these violent acts. Now, why would Hearst do that? Well, one of the reasons he would do it, well, they dropped the word cannabis and started using the word marijuana. And it was kind of like, hey, the Mexicans mm-hmm. brought over marijuana and it's really bad. Yeah. And Hearst, why he had the power is he had about 28 publications that he could print and own the messaging that goes out to Americans. We didn't have TV. We couldn't call each other. Mm-mm. The, the connections were, oh my gosh, did you read the paper? That is the truth. And one sure. of the reasons he would do that is because he had lumber and hemp was a great alternative for paper. Oh, so it, it hurt the him on a yes. well, Right. It's always at the end of it, isn't it? It's yeah, always it is. at the end of it. But the new messages start coming out like, be so scared and aware and mm-hmm. they're shrewd dope peddlers and, and, you know, just these uneducated fights. They just started fighting. Well, and it's funny, Stormy. By, you, know, I, you know, I never really thought about the difference between hearing marijuana and hearing the word cannabis. Somehow, well, it, cannabis, when you take a moment and you okay. listen, it sounds a little easier to take in somehow. Well, I think that that's our history. That's the stigma. That's yeah. a piece of the stigma Yeah, is, you know, when the Mexican came over, they were calling it marijuana. That mm-hmm. was their real name for it. And Hearst started referring to it as marijuana. And then who knows if that confused the American consumer, if they well, thought it was something different than cannabis or more than yeah. cannabis. Who knows? Yeah, you don't know. I mean, at least we're, we're going back and looking. I mean, I guess I just get a chuckle out of the fact that booze has been around forever. We celebrate booze on Instagram. I mean, God knows I did with my martini yesterday, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right. It must have been pretty. <laughs> so it was really pretty. I'm at 
Megan M. Biro, by the way, on Instagram, Stormy, if you're over there, let's have some fun. Um, yes. But yeah, I mean, it's just, it is interesting. I know there are a ton of uses for the cannabis plant beyond what most people know. Tell us some of those. This, the hemp plant, right? So hemp, it's out, it's unbelievable what this plant can do, right? In addition to our endocannabinoid system actually being named after the cannabinoid system of this plant because we we put them together after the plant was named. So in addition to our bodies being named after this plant, it's good for, I mean, you can use it in food, salad dressing, paper. Everybody knows the textile industry, but apparel, think about it for diapers, fine fabrics. We haven't even gotten there yet to where we can turn it into some silkies, but it can be, the oils can be in your soap, your shampoo, granola, food. You can eat the seeds and it's very healthy for you. I hear varnishes and oil paint. It's pretty much everything from packaging to insulation to hempcrete. There's a new product out called hempcrete. So I think once we grow enough hemp and people have access to it in the United States and we're able to grow it and start taking the plant to create other products, people will be very surprised. You know, and I think it's going to cut a lot of costs out of some of the things that we do and the way that we do it. But the, the, the good news is we can now get our hands on it. Tell us about Sophie. Oh, little Sophie Ryan. I'm actually here in LA to see Sophie and go to an event today. To talk about Sophie is to talk about her parents. Um, Sophie was diagnosed with a brain tumor that sits on her optic nerve. Now, I would try to pronounce the name, but I normally mess that up. You know, this tumor will grow on Sophie's brain until Sophie stops growing. So the goal is to keep it small and get her through adulthood. Sophie's parents, when she was diagnosed, were devastated. This is actually outlined in a movie called Weed the People that was just released. Um, was at some film festivals, but Weed the People, uh, produced by Abby Webb Epstein and Ricky Lake, told part of Sophie's story within this movie. But uh, Tracy, her mother, felt that chemo was so harsh on this little eight-month-old baby and began researching cannabis and found people that were familiar enough with the plant as a medicine that had done things on their own because there is is no you know medical support here in the state. And by golly, she started figuring out what dosage to give her daughter. Yeah. And now the results for Sophie have been great. Doctors have left Western medicine to follow this girl's story. What I want to say is that no point is Sophie and other people that I know with ailments who utilize cannabis to augment their treatment. Sophie receives medical treat medical or Western medicine just like anyone else is. The difference is she augments that with cannabis and they're seeing great results. Mm -hmm. And again, um, you know, and as importantly, it's giving everybody hope for Sophie. And that's not for nothing. Sophie and everyone. Yeah. No. Right. You know, that is a it's a big deal. Cannabis and children, people want to that's a tough conversation to mm -hmm. start. Yeah. Until you're talking with parents that are fighting for their child's life. Yeah. And then it's not so tough to have. No. In fact, you're grateful there's another alternative. You're hopeful every time we learn one more thing about it. And also, if you can stop a child, a human, not just a child, anyone from starting on an opiate regime or regimen, an opiate regimen, and instead of a plant-based potential painkiller, I'll take the deal any day. I'll start there. And that's the same with children. You know, you, you don't want to give them the heavy drugs that are going to stay in their system or, right, right. you know, create a, a addictive behavior. You know, that happens at any age. So I think, you know, Sophie is, is paving a way for us to all have the conversation about what we do give our children and why a plant medicine would be different than, you know, the nitrogen gas they might breathe when they get their wisdom teeth out or pain meds they might take for something else. I'm going to take out my crystal ball for a moment. Talk to us about your predictions for the industry? Well, that's really hard. And I say that because two years ago when I stepped in, I thought one thing and then every six months it's kind of changed, including where my the shiny object for whatever passion I have or whatever vertical of this market I find interest in. But the future, I actually think ultimately the federal government's going to approve this plant as a medicine. That's ultimate. I hope that state, and this is a tricky, controversial thing to say, but I hope that states are brave enough to go recreation, go recreational yeah. before that happens. And the reason I say that is there are all sorts of benefits happening in states that are legal, both medicinally and recreationally. 
the reason I think recreational is important is because the people that have figured this plant out to date haven't been the federal government. The federal government holds a patent on one of the compounds in this plant, yet they say there's no healing abilities, but they hold the patent. We're looking for approval from people that have, you know, get their money in place first. That's my feel. Well, oh, this is a and, I want, and Stormy, I want everybody to know you can do that without having the psychoactive ingredients that change your brain and your body chemistry as well. I was just, right? yes, I was I just think going to get to that. Caveat yes. here. It is an important caveat, but it's one, when we talk about that one compound of cannabis that gets you high, we're leaving out 430 plus compounds that we don't talk about. We talk about one piece of this plant. And yes, there are ways, you know, get the plant in the hands of people who can research it. The most important thing. And the states are going to, the states are allowing that to happen. Talk to us about job growth. I'm hearing more and more about really interesting roles that are popping up in the cannabis industry. Well, from a couple of years, I guess it was about a year ago, 280,000 jobs to create, 280,000 jobs by 2020. Isn't that crazy? Awesome. Uh, by 2025, total sales expected to exceed 24 billion, 24 yeah. billion. Now, th what this doesn't say is if it's medicinal only or recreational only and how they're getting to that without knowing what states are participating. But in 2016, the medical market, $4.7 billion. Crazy numbers. Right? Maybe it's a little hype, some of these numbers, but they're still big. That's the bigger point here. What's the butterfly effect? The butterfly effect is the cartels or violent distributors a cannabis right, way down the end of a line, you know, all of those activities stop. You know, there's good things that stop too. And I, I guess for me as an advocate, what I want people to do is be educated and form their opinion based on that, on a, on a pure self-directed education level. Like you, it sounds yes, like you took we, that path yourself so you can speak from your heart and your mind about that. Tell us, Stormy, how can people learn more about the work you're doing in the future of the industry? Because I think that's where it starts, is learning. Yes. Uh, well, the work that I'm doing, you know, I love being an advocate. I have my hand in about five different cookie jars right now and um, have really enjoyed going around the country, meeting people and starting the conversations that can potentially change their mind or spark their interest enough to get their self-directed education. And where I would say to go that is the Marijuana Policy Project, MPP, uh, they go by, but online, they keep a great library of what each state has done, research papers. You can find so much information just there. Now, from there, you can go and find white papers that were done in 1970. You can find the history of what has actually been done with this plant on a medicinal level because people have been fighting for it the whole time. It hasn't been dormant, right? It's not just sitting there with nobody trying to progress what we can discover about this plant. It's been happening. It's just been happening underground by good people, not the cartel, not the people that are bringing, you know, drugs in that cause violent crimes. These are people that are just like you and me, passionate about this. Well, mm -hmm. I'm passionate about this plant, but they're people that are dedicated to figuring it out with or without the federal government saying, you know what, we approve this now. So that's, I've completely enjoyed meeting those folks and I encourage the listeners to just start reading this is a big deal in our lifetime. Yeah. History books will be written and we are all, whether we simply read about it or we jump in, we are all a part of it. This part of our future. Hey, Stormy, thanks so much for stopping by. We've all really learned quite a bit today. Wow, Megan, what a fascinating conversation with a real trailblazer. I wanted to learn more about the cannabis industry, so I called someone who knows a lot about the ins and outs of operating a cannabis company. Keegan Peterson started the company Work, that's W-U-R-K, to manage all the back office operations and challenges that cannabis companies face today. So Keegan, we just talked to one pioneer in the cannabis industry, Stormy Simon. So tell us, how did you get involved in the industry? Yeah, so I, I'd been watching the industry for a while and I uh, personally uh, wanted to come in and, and be able to apply my skill set to kind of the needs of the industry as it expanded. And a friend of mine here in Denver had a dispensary that had grown to 100 employees and they had been dropped by their sixth payroll and HR vendor. And so he reached out to me and asked for some help in supporting his company. And so uh, that's when I knew my, uh, the calling was there. And so I dropped what I was doing and started focusing on helping him and his business. And then eventually realized that 
the challenges he were ha he was having were systemic in the in the entire industry, and that there was a bigger opportunity to serve more people. That's awesome. And and by the way, it's, we know regardless of where it's actually been legalized. And I just was telling you before we started, uh, I live in California and now Canada, the whole country, right? Yep. It's just legalized marijuana and the consumption and the sale from a consumer standpoint. But there's still, again, this a heavy stigma that's attached to the cannabis industry. So what are some of the unique challenges, um, obvious ones as well as maybe not so obvious, that cannabis companies face today? Yeah, if you're if you're looking through the the lens of a cannabis owner or operator, um, one of the challenges is that each state has a, a different set of regulations that they have to comply with, and those uh, regulations are very unique to the cannabis industry, and they're very complex and they change very frequently. And if you run a business in multiple states, then you have multiple sets of regulations that you've got to comply with, or your doors get shut down. So that's the biggest issue. Uh, banking is very limited in the industry. Probably 50% of the space has a bank account, and the other 50% is still operating in cash. Uh, and then the last main challenge for these businesses is taxes. Uh, there's a provision out there called 280E, which we can dive into if you'd like to, or, or we can uh, save that for another time. But effectively, it uh, hamstrings these businesses from be, being able to deduct certain tax uh, expenses. And most of these businesses are paying 80%, 90% effective tax rates, which is starving their business. So <laughs> that's, and that's not by accident, right? Unfortunately? the With the tax piece of it? Yeah, with the tax piece of it. Yeah, the tax piece came about in the 80s when there was um, some drug dealers that had gotten picked up for tax evasion. And uh, the IRS realized that they had been riding their house, their boat, and their cars off on their taxes, and they wanted to make sure that didn't happen again. And so they put in a uh, provision 280E to stop that from happening. And fast forward now to the cannabis industry, uh, we're in a federally illegal state, of, you know, state legal. And so as the IRS is a federal bureau, it's, um, it's still imposing these archaic tax measures against the cannabis industry. But let's take that a step further because obviously that not, I mean, so that's, again, as you, I think you use the word starving the, the companies, uh, that's obviously going to impact um, potential employees that would work for any of these organizations, right? I mean, in, in regards to just adding that la la layer of payroll tax and providing benefits, I mean, how complicated is that going to be? And, and do, you, do you see, is there light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to, you know, staffing organizations that are in the cannabis, cannabis industry? Yeah, it's become very important to, to track your employees down to the, to the minute on the exact tasks that they're performing. Um, this tax provision, um, basically, if you are uh, selling the product or retailing the product, costs associated with that are not part of your cost of goods. But in the production side, you can deduct typical expenses. And so you, you have an employee that works in the grow and the dispensary. Some of that time is deductible, some of it is not. And then you, it, it gets even more granular within a dispensary, depending on what they're doing. If they're rolling a joint, which is producing a product that's deductible. If they're you know, cashiering, then they're selling the product that's not. And so it, um, you know, the IRS has even gone to the far extent in some of their audits of asking for video footage of what employees are doing. So you know, businesses are trying to create very unique strategies to staff the business and being able to track the staff to make sure that they are putting themselves in, in the best position to be taxed to, to reduce their tax burden. Boy, it's 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 uh, the glamorous life of working in handcuffs, it uh, sounds like, <laughs> unfortunately. So, but that said though, where do you see the industry the industry going? Do you see that this is, do you think that this may change over time? I mean, you know, any industry that's heavily regulated, it's, it's always it adds a, a really cumbersome layer to the business itself. And, and we can have a whole other show about that. But I mean, where do you think it's going as, overall as an industry? Yeah, I mean, polls are now showing 60% of folks are in support of recreational cannabis across the United States. Over 90% are in support of medical cannabis. So the people are, are speaking out and, and they're speaking in favor of, of legalization. So I think that this is, for the meantime, it's going to be a state's issue and it's going to continue to spread out. And we're now starting to see led, you know, state legislative bodies that are actually passing cannabis legislation. So um, I think that, that we're, we're on the path to legalization. How long that's going to take is still up in the air, but I don't think there's anything stopping this train at this point in time. And, and, and 
at the end of the day, you know, this, this product is helping people. It's helping save lives. It's helping children. And so it's making a real impact in, in the communities that we are living and serving. So uh, it's going to be a hard thing to stop at this point in time, which is exciting for everybody. Oh, I'd agree. I'm, I'm a total proponent. I grew up in a very conservative family and God rest my dad's soul. I could talk about him and I'm sure you wouldn't mind even today. He was a, a police officer and a police detective for 32 years in a small town where I grew up in the Central Valley of California. And one of the things that he was always very progressive on, and it always struck me as, as odd, is that is, was the legalization of any, any and all drugs, marijuana, narcotics. Very progressive. But it was very, very progressive for him, and considering how conservative he actually was. But he, he, and he told me, he said, I, I believe maybe in your lifetime or at least your children's lifetime that we will see this change and we are seeing a change now so there you go so so listen though for people who are who are still skeptical at the end of the day what makes you optimistic about the future of marijuana yeah i mean now there's studies that are are being conducted uh, and research and and and, you know, we live in a bubble here in the United States, but this, this cannabis legalization is something that's going on worldwide right now. And as you saw from Canada legalizing, um, you know, Mexico is looking at this, Colombia, Italy, Germany, Australia. This, this is a worldwide uh, shift in mindset. And so, and, and, and it's hard, you know, I think people are now starting to get the personal stories of their family member that is suffering from some kind of condition and, and cannabis was the last resort. Mm -hmm. And it changed their life where it gave them, you know, a couple of days of life where it was as enjoyable as possible. It's going to be hard for people to turn a blind eye anymore and say, well, you know, they don't have the experience, so they don't, they don't understand. And therefore it's not good. Now everybody has somebody in their life that has had an experience with it. So I think that's what's going to keep on driving this force. And the more stories that get shared, the more this is going, you know, the stigma is going to change. Yeah. I, I probably have, I'll end on, on one final personal note too, that it probably, and it, obviously I think this also had an impact on my father was my mother had suffered long-term autoimmune disorder as well as uh, lots of neurological pain and there was there were times when it, this was the only thing that could help her as well so there you go listen um this well, is been, go ahead, this real quick there's there's actually a film coming out i, I had the opportunity to uh, work with abby epstein and, and ricky lake to do a documentary and i, I just kind of supported it but uh, the film's called weed the people and it's six kids who are are going through chemo and using cannabis to help them through that process. And, and they uh, document their lives over six years of going through that. And it's going to be airing next year. It's now doing private screenings all over the United States. And it's things like that and, and stories like your mom and your dad that are, are what's changing people's perspective. So I highly recommend folks check that out. It'll uh, show a personal story of uh, six young children that are really suffering and, and this was really uh, helpful to them in their lives. Well, right on to that. And that's, what's it, What's the title of the film again? Weed the People. Weed the People. Very nice. All right. Well, Keegan, it's been a pleasure talking with you. And thanks again so much for being on Work Trends. Thank you so much. Like it or not, it's an industry on the move and will continue to grow legally more and more. These are clearly exciting times. <sighs> what did you say? What? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. I'm just go ahead and close the show, dude. Thanks to listening to Work Trends from Talent Culture. Join us every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern for a live Twitter chat with our podcast guest. To learn more about guests featured on today's show, visit the show notes for this episode at talentculture.com and help us spread the word. Subscribe to Work Trends wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a rating, review, and iTunes. Share Work Trends with your coworkers, your friends. Look forward to it. See you next time.